Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Connor Goodwin. I'm the communications manager here at ProPublica, and I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join us today. Last week, ProPublica launched the Repatriation Project, an investigative series that found some of the nation's most prestigious institutions, including the, the American Museum of Natural History and Harvard University, have failed to return or resisted giving back indigenous remains and burial items long after the 1990 passage of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, known as NAGPRA. Three decades later, more than 100,000 remains are still held by museums, universities, and federal agencies. ProPublica wanted to learn why this was the case, and we're not alone. That's why you're here too. Our reporters wanted to help enable journalists and NAGPRA practitioners to research which institutions still have Native American remains using ProPublica's repatriation map and search tool. Today's webinar is intended to show you how to use the tool and offer guidance on how to report on this issue. Today's program is split into four sections and each section has Q&A time built in. So if you have a question at any point, please send it our way and we'll do our best to get to it. You can do so by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and typing it there. In the first section, we'll give an overview of the repatriation project, explaining what NAGPRA is and how the repatriation process works. In the second section, we'll offer a detailed walkthrough demonstration of our map and search tool. And if you'd like to us to consider covering a specific institution or geographic area, please feel free to submit those in the Q&A box as well. And then in the third section is designed specifically with journalists in mind. So our reporters will offer tips for reporting on this issue, including cultivating sources, useful records and how to obtain them, and best practices for covering this issue with sensitivity. And the final section is devoted to answering questions from the audience, and we'll do our best to address all of them. So once again, to submit a question, click the Q&A icon and type it there. And now, allow me to introduce you to some of the reporters who spent more than a year working on the repatriation project. Ash New is a reporter, designer, and developer with ProPublica's News App team. Graham Lee Brewer is a national investigative reporter at NBC News covering Indigenous communities. He is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and vice president of the Native American Journalists Association. Mary Huditz is a reporter for ProPublica's Southwest unit focused on tribal issues. She is a Crow Tribe member and former president of the Native American Journalists Association. And Logan Jaffe is a reporter for ProPublica's newsletter team. Before I hand it over to the reporters, I'd like to make just two requests. First, please sign up for the repatriation newsletter. We have more stories on the way and that's the best way to stay updated on the series. I'll share a sign up link momentarily. Second, we'd love to hear how you used our data whether that takes the form of a news story or a lesson plan for students. Please share the final outcome with us by emailing events at propublica.org and mentioning repatriation in the subject line. Thanks again for joining us. I'll let Mary take it from here. Too. Uh, we're really heartened that so many of you are joining us for a conversation how to respectfully report on repatriation. Already we started to see outlets pursue their own stories in their own regions and um, we're really, really glad about that. Um, I think the very best place for us to start uh, is to look at the law of NAGPRA itself. And I'm going to hand it over to Logan to guide us through that. Sure. Thanks, Mary, and thanks everyone for being here. So um, NAGPRA, some people will tell you it's complicated. Some people will tell you that it is not complicated, but um, just to shortly explain it, NAGPRA stands for the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Um, it's a federal law. It was passed in 1990 after a long indigenous movement to find a way to get their ancestors and cultural items returned back from institutions and also to protect them on federal lands. Um, and the law lays out a process for that to happen. And who NAGPRA applies to is any institution that has received federal money. This you know, could be in the form of a grant. Um, more recently, we've been learning that 
this can also apply to institutions that have received PPP loans over the pandemic. Um, there's lots of different ways that an institution can become subject to NAGPRA. And sometimes actually institutions might not even know that they are now subject to NAGPRA after using a particular you know, pot of money from the federal government. So, and I should say under the law also, the, an institution, um, the law just refers to them all as museums. <laughs> um, we keep using the word institution in our reporting, but just so you know, if you, you know, do more reporting on this and come across it, um, the word museum applies to all of these sorts of inst institutions. And what, there's a couple things that the law requires these institutions to do. Two of them that are kind of, you know, front and center here is what those institutions have to do is report to the federal government. And in this case, it is the National NAGPRA office, which is under the Department of the Interior. They have to report all Native American human remains and cultural items that it holds and also to notify or consult with descendants um, and tribal nations about those holdings. Um, there's a couple different, I guess, eras of NAGPRA. And you know, some of you might know this very well and some of you might, might not, but it's good to know. So kind of the way that we've <clears throat> been thinking about it is NAGPRA from like 1990 to 2010. And in this era of NAGPRA, Repatriation was very, um, I guess, contingent on this phrase cultural affiliation. So institutions were required to repatriate or return belongings only when it can establish what the law calls cultural affiliation between descendants or um, a tribal nation and ancestors or belongings that were in that um, institution's collections. So this cultural affiliation the, like there's a lot of different forms of evidence that the law lays out for how to, for like what's, I guess, acceptable forms of evidence. And this was meant to be, um, you know, very inclusive of a lot of different kinds of evidence from like oral history, linguistics, um, historical evidence, such as maps, geographical evidence, um, biological evidence, and Basically, you could only repatriate when an institution and a tribe agreed that that tribe was the sort of rightful owners of, of these belongings and, and um, ancestral remains. So after 2010, the law changed a bit and the law created a pathway where repatriation or return wasn't necessarily contingent on cultural affiliation and it kind of started this newer movement that that we're seeing where multiple tribes could you know form coalitions and tribal councils and kind of approach repatriation in a bit more of a collective way so um we can go into a bit more detail about some of this later if you if you all are interested but um I guess one thing to note right now is that it is a really interesting time to be reporting on NAGPRA one, because there are new regulations in that are kind of being proposed and hashed out disc and discussed right now. And that conversation has been going on for a long time. But one thing on the table with those proposed regulations is just eliminating the use of cultural affiliation altogether, among some other changes that are really important to know about too. But also that we really do seem to be in an era of like a newer generation of NAGPRA. Um, there's been turnover in staff, um, some younger archaeologists, curators, new generation of um, tribal historic preservation officers in some cases are coming about this law and often like not knowing anything about it. And, you know, one day they are, they realize they have to, you know, comply with this. And that has been changing a lot of the ways that institutions have been going about this. So, um, and we'll talk about that. Uh, a little bit later as well. So hand it back to Mary. I'll well, like bring up a really important point that I think in our news organizations, we're often asked like why we're reporting on the story now and our readers wonder that too. Um, I think it'd be helpful. I'll just note for the audience also that I think as we did this reporting, at least each of us were asked at least once by sources when we first met them why another question, which is 
why we are reporting on NAGPRA, what has drawn us to the topic, why we think it's important. Um, and I think it's valuable as reporters to kind of consider that as you pursue your stories too. Um, and I would say for us, our group, um, our entry points, I think we all had different entry points to the topic. Um, you know, Logan, for instance, if I recall, I'll recall correctly, I hope, but correct me, is that you had um, heard about this story from a source uh, work while working on, or this topic from a source while working on another story. Um, I had covered repatriation, though, in a bit of a different context than U.S. museums, a lot reporter at the AP, and uh, those were had mostly, those stories had mostly been spot stories. Um, and then beyond that, I think I understood, as I think a lot of Native people do, that um, that museums have just had our ancestors for a very long time and their belongings and tribal, um, like cultur culturally sacred items. Um, and so I think I also entered into this understanding that that is a reality that is a part of uh, Native life or a reality for tribes. Um, one other thing, one thing that we, I think we did have in common as an entry point to the story was some of the like basic overarching data. Um, so for example, um, we knew that it's, we each knew as many of you do too in the audience that institutions hold a hundred, more than a hundred thousand ancestral remains. And in 30 years since Snapper's passage, um, less than half has been repatriated back to tribes. And um, so asking why the promises of NACRA had not yet been fulfilled after so much time was a clear and obvious central question, I think that guided a lot of our work. Another thing that guided, I think our work from the outset was the consensus to um, practicing cultural sensitivity at every turn. Um, and much of those discussions revolved around um, the images we would use. I think our photo editors I'm grateful, decided that we would not show um, images of ancestral remains with our stories. And then I think as reporters and writers um, and those of us producing text um, also made the decision, uh, made a lot of decisions and um, had a lot of conversations around the language we chose to use. And so I think we can go to the next slide um, and just do a quick overview of that before we get to the, the data portion. Um, I think, Logan, you had a lot of um, really thoughtful, I think, conversation with sources about terminology on human remains, and I wondered if you would. Yeah, of course. Okay. So, yeah. so I guess, like, generally speaking, um, you know, we tried to recognize when, or I guess, sort of when language was veering to be or kind of originating from this more like seemingly objective, but really kind of coming out of the science science and, and research world. So, you know, we avoided, um, definitely avoided words like specimens, which is totally, which is dehumanizing when you're talking about this in terms of, um, I mean, in any terms, but particularly, I guess, with NAGPRA um, and really trying to, center the fact there are all these other um terms for how human remains are talked about in the law um but trying to avoid i guess separating their those ancestors humanity um so just being really mindful of, of what sort of words you're using to describe those individuals the law uses this term mni um which you know technically means minimum number of individuals so it's that's how all of our numbers are are represented in part because that is how nagpra counts those so those could be you know partial um human remains but they are all counted as as a single individual so that we wanted to kind of base our reporting on that too yeah i would say that's one thing i um you know as you look at different data like well, I think I've been thankful that the law or the federal data has um, has this uniform approach to like counting ancestors as as people. Um, and then I would, in addition to talking about human remains, of course, um, items are a big part of the law too. And 
Um, you'll see a lot of terminology as far as like, I think affiliated funeral objects is, is listed in the data or unaffiliated funeral objects. Um, and those are very technical terms and I suppose they need to be. Um, but when we're talking about writing, then I think you kind of have the same sort of thought process of what does it take to make sure that what we're discussing um, is relatable, belong to a people. And so belongings started to feel like the most um, appropriate word, though there's others that I think work. I think funeral objects is accurate. So is cultural items, um, sometimes sacred items, if that is in fact what you're discussing. Um, and then the, there are also terms that we avoid when we're talking about objects, which I would say first and foremost would be sort of the more antiquated ones, but that you still might see in documents if you're re reviewing historical documents, which is like grave goods, um, burial goods, which kind of commercializes um, things, items that are very precious to people. And then um, I think, while not inaccurate, also we would use artifacts less so because I think that is, um, it sort of just otherizes, I think, these these sacred items that, again, were very precious to, to different people at, at different points in time. Um, then I guess we also, there's other realms, I think when we talk about place, and then also talk about treads and cells. Um, I think Graham can offer a lot of good guidance on that, on tribal nations. Oh, yeah, just be really specific, like hyper specific at every opportunity. Um, that's actually a lot of people don't realize this now, but that's actually uh, been a up, recent update to the Associated Press's style guide is that um, you wouldn't say um, uh, Native American when you could be as specific about uh, tribal affiliation. Um, but also just that that, that doesn't always um not every tribal an indigenous community that you're going to deal with when it comes to um, the repatriation of ancestral remains or funerary objects is going to uh, necessarily be a, a federally recognized tribe. You're going to deal with a lot of state um, recognized entities and, and tribal groups and, and, and tribal nations that don't have the same um, uh, level of, uh, they don't have the same power uh, under the federal law. Uh, but all that is to say that uh, you, you're also going to be dealing with Native Hawaiian organizations, uh, Native Alaskan corporations. Um, and so um, there's no real one catch all here. You have to be, uh, e e you know, each story is going to be on a case by case basis. Um, but also just trying to avoid some of the uh, language, um, you know, instituting tribal nations. And in when you can say uh, instead of the word just tribes, you know, the finding ways to respect their 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 sovereignty uh, when you speak about them just the same that you would do for any state or federal uh, entity in your reporting otherwise. Really technical um, but important language. So. Mary, did we want to take the question that Connor put in the chat? I can answer the first one. Um, so I'll, just read, I'll just read the question out loud. It's um, as many tribes either lack federal recognition or have had their status terminated. How does that play into institutions resistance to return remains? Um, and that, that's a good question. Uh, so under NAGPRA, um, non-federally recognized tribes and groups are treated uh, not on an equal level to federally recognized tribes. Um, oftentimes, uh, if you are not a federally recognized tribe, the institution will not engage with you depending on their policies. Um, uh, Non-federally recognized tribes might have to work with a federally recognized tribe to sort of partner with them and get um, remains or, or funerary objects repatriated. Um, so it's a definite hurdle, uh, especially in states where there aren't tribes with federal recognition, um, or there are a substantial number of tribes that, uh, it, for instance, in California, that don't have federal recognition. Um, California actually has a separate state law, uh, CalNAGPRA, which um, 
is more inclusive of non-federally recognized tribes. Um, all to say that uh, it's there's a lot of wrinkles to NAGPRA. There's a lot of different groups that it encompasses and are involved. Um, and uh, unfortunately, as the law stands right now, uh, non-federally recognized groups get sort of short drifted on that end. They do. And I just want to add one quick thing to that, Ash, is that um, there is a way through the law for um, tribes without federal recognition to appeal specifically to the, this committee that the law has. It's um, the NAGPRA Review Committee. So through a kind of like special permission, uh, you know, you could pursue repatriation that way, but that is completely reliant, as Ash was saying, basically on that institution and whether they want to even work with you. Um, and then I think maybe the second question in that group of questions was, how did institutions acquire remains and other important objects from state? I think that they, the institution is not in itself. Um, so for instance, Arizona State Museum having remains from California or Washington or Texas. Um, and uh, it definitely varies from institution to institution, um, but the basic premise was that people were doing archeological expeditions or other, um, maybe somebody donated uh, remains, uh, donated being uh, the word being used in a lot of these, these records. Um, and maybe they took them across state lines. Um, there's a lot of trading that happens within academic circles for research purposes. Um, uh, as well as just to sort of, I think, especially early on in the history of, of, uh, of, of America, um, a lot of these institutions were just trying to collect whatever they could from all across the country so that they could have sort of an encyclopedia um, within their own institution. And um, so it's not just like California institutions will have California remains. There are quite a few institutions that have um, remains and objects from all across the country. Um, and that's one of the things that we think is really surprising about the maps, just showing the scope um, of a lot of these institutions holdings. Um, and so I guess I'll move on from, thanks for the introduction, Mary and Logan. Um, uh, I'm Ash New, the News Apps developer, um, along with my colleague Andrea, who's not here right now, we developed the tool that um, we're, we're talking about today. And um, before we dive into the tool, I wanted to talk a little bit more about some of the language that we're using, um, because it is uh, something that I've spent a lot of time on. Um, one of the things that comes up a lot, this sort of info box that we have, which says, what does made available for return mean? Because that's the dominant phrase that we're using. Um, colloquially, as I think Mary and Logan have said, return or repatriate is a very common, or affiliate is a very common verb to use. Um, less colloquially, but more accurately, there's to complete the NAGPRA process or um, to transfer control. Um, and in our work, we've been really striving to hit that balance of accuracy, but uh, legibility to the public. Um, and so that's sort of how we landed on the made available for return language. The data that we have relies on the notices that are published when institutions have determined a connection between tribes and remains. And these notices don't actually um, tell us whether or not remains were physically returned. All they do is say that um, the tribes are uh, able to claim these remains, that the remains are available for return. So um, you might even see some of these institutions have 100% that were made available for return. For some institutions, that could mean that their holdings, they have none of the remains physically inside of their institution anymore. Um, for some institutions, it could mean that some of them are still there and some of them are not. Um, and so we've really tried to be delicate with the language here um, and use that made available for return language, which we've worked um, on with in consultation with um, practitioners who are in this space. Um, and then the other thing that I'll say um, 
I think uh, my notes here. Um, so the notices, when we say that it's um, made available for return to a tribe, oftentimes um, the remains are made available for return to multiple tribes. Um, and maybe only one tribe will take the lead on the repatriation or actually do the physical repatriation. Um, and so that's just something to be cognizant of, especially on some of the pages that we have for the tribes. You might see a really large number like, oh, 2,000 remains that were made available for return to the tribe. Um, in a lot of cases, the tribe is not actually going to have received all of those remains because they're in these groups of affiliation. Um, and so there's some nuance there to be had. Um, so I'll move on to this slide, which talks about who this database is for. And I think we've been looking at some of the email uh, names that we've been getting in uh, as uh, you know people who signed up for this webinar. And it seems like we're excited, you know, we're excited to have members of the public. We're excited to have reporters. We're excited to have people who work on NAGPRA um, in institutions and for tribes. I think we are now running a poll about what your affiliation is. Um, and so this is really for all of those groups. Um, you know, in building this tool, we saw an opportunity to um, make some information much more visible and public um, that would help with as sort of an accountability measure um, to let people, especially the public, look up museums and universities near them that might still have Native American remains. Um, and I think that really gets to the heart of the awareness question, which is, you know, a lot of people don't know that this law exists. A lot of people don't know that this practice occurred. Um, and the more people know about this possibility of repatriation, um, you know, the more people could, you know, learn about the law, learn about maybe, maybe you volunteer at a local historical society or you have a, a friend who works for a museum or a university. Um, and the more people who know about this, um, the more eyes there are on the ground who could say, hey, we think that this might be subject to NAGPRA. Um, so that's one thing that this tool could be for. We also wanted to just um, sort of help facilitate repatriation by making this information really easily sort of um, accessible for folks who say that they work for a museum, they don't have a lot of resources, a lot of time to do the research to figure out which tribes might be connected to remains that they might have. And you can um, pretty easily look up if you know the county or the state that their um, remains were from, you can figure out, okay, these other tribes have previously been affiliated to remains from this area. Um, that might not mean that that tribe or those tribes may have a claim or interest in, in the remains that your institution has, but um, it's a first step. Um, and I think that's, one of the hopes that we have for this tool as well. And then if you're a reporter as well, um, we are able to show you sort of the institutional track record, um, repatriations done over time, which is really fascinating. Um, and I'll dig into that more as we do the live share. Um, some caveats to the data, because I am apparently all about the caveats and the asterisks in this project. Um, the data is self-reported. so. It has some quirks, you know, um, there are institutions uh, who have reached out to us and have said that their numbers are outdated or they're inaccurate. And we really welcome them to update their numbers with National NAGPRA because that is the only way that we can sort of keep track of things from the national bird's eye view. Um, uh, the numbers, I think, like Marion Logan said, are minimum estimates. So, you know, museums, when they're doing counting, um, it they might not be very detailed in a first pass. And when they're getting closer to repatriation, they're able to more readily identify uh, the number of individuals that might be represented in a group of remains. Um, there are also some institutions that are subject to NAGPRA that haven't reported. We've heard anecdotal evidence of this occurring. Um, and they might not be in the, uh, if you type in a name and your institution doesn't show up, it doesn't mean necessarily that they don't have Native American remains. It might mean that they just haven't reported them. Um, and so these numbers are best taken as estimates. And 
sort of as a preference, uh, we like to try and round the numbers because the specificity that um, is provided is oftentimes, uh, it makes people think that the numbers are way more accurate than they might actually be. Um, so that's something that you can think about as you report to use phrases like at least more than rounded number, um, or like this is the reported number of remains instead of saying it just is the number of remains. Um, and those I think are all the caveats. Um, we'll move on to the pages that we have. And I think they got maybe a little bit mixed up. Um, the home page is the first page that we have. And it shows the bird's eye view of the whole nation with this big map. Um, it has a list of all the institutions and all of the tribes that have been involved in this process. Um, and it's a good place to start. It has the search box too, although every page has the search box. Um, it's a good place to start. And then uh, we also have institution pages, which you know you can look up a particular institution, like uh, I think some of these screenshots are UC Berkeley. Um, and I'll go a little bit more into depth on each of these. We have tribe pages, which are pretty unique in that um, National NAGPRA, before doing this project, uh, they were not able to search NAGPRA records by tribe. Um, we've done some uh, data work to be able to do this um, using all publicly available data. Um, and we're able to really show sort of repatriation over time from the tribal perspective as well and demonstrate the scope um, of work that these tribes have been involved in since the 1990s. Um, and then we also have state and county pages, which for some of our reporters who are based in a specific region can be really helpful starting points as well. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and switch to the live share. Uh, would I, and I'm just looking at some of the questions. Would I be able to share where you obtain data on the amount of remains made of yeah, so data sources um, conveniently are my next slide. Uh, the data sources are National NAGPRA and also the Federal Register. Um, and that's really it. The National NAGPRA is the, in the group that maintains all these records uh, nationwide. Um, and I think their info is right there. Um, so I'll switch right over to the uh, app here. Can folks see that? Um, this is just a little bit of intro. I think probably most folks have seen that uh, to give context as to what we're getting into. Um, if people have specific, you know, states or institutions or tribes that they'd like me to look up, please feel free to try and pop that in the Q&A and we'll see if we can um, do that. Um, but I'll just start here with, uh, I think, the University of Berkeley, because they are the institution that has the largest amount of uh, Native American remains um, still in their holdings. Um, you can also type in anything that you like, really, you know, California. Um, and you could search just for things in California, and you'd get a whole list here. But I'll go to Berkeley. Um, and uh, if you're looking into a particular institution, obviously the summary here will give you the highest level of information that you might want. If you're looking for more detailed information um, on specific counties, uh, the specific holding of the institution, and maybe areas where the institution has successfully repatriated and areas where the institution has not, um, the map is a really good place to start. So. University of Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley is interesting because they have a lot of remains from California, um, but even outside of California, they um, have some remains and you can hover over each of these um, for more details. Uh, you could even click in further if you'd like um, to get to a state or a county page. Um, one thing to note about these maps, there are some remains that have no location information, so they're not actually visualized. Um, and that's what's in this note here. Um, the timelines I think are really interesting. Uh, you can see whether or not an institution has done a lot over the past 30 years or not. Um, here we have an instance of Berkeley. Uh, you see that they have started to do some repatriation after uh, something like a decade of relatively small action. 
And all of these remains, or for the most part, most of the remains have been returned through the cultural affiliation clause, uh, which is, uh, you know, they've made a very specific affiliation to a set of tribes. There are some institutions, um, for instance, like the Tennessee Valley Authority, which um, you see this big stack of gray, they've mostly done their repatriations through disposition. Um, and that is uh, sort of, uh, I would say a, a lower bar. Um, it's like related to geographic affiliation oftentimes, um, and oftentimes involves larger groups of tribes. Um, but, you know, it's really interesting that TVA around the 2015, 2012 era started to really move on repatriation. And so as a reporter, when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, okay, what changed? Um, for TVA, it was a government audit. Um, they, yeah, there was a government audit, I think from the GAO that, that published around that time, which um, sort of spurred some reform there. Um, there are other institutions, I think, uh, I forgot exactly which one it is. I think it might be Michigan. Yeah, Michigan State. Michigan State University, almost 100% uh, made available for a turn. You can also see that um, in the past sort of two years, three years, um, they've done a lot of disposition work. So perhaps if you uh, are a reporter in Michigan area, um, talking to the NAGPRA coordinators there and learning about, you know, what's changed, why has there been this sort of um, increase in repatriations um, after relative stagnation over the past couple decades. Um, another th great thing about uh, sort of institution pages is that um, you're able to see which, in which tribes the institution has uh, made Native American remains available to, um, and uh, as well as potentially if we have a response from them, some institutions have emailed in a little bit more background from the university itself or the institution itself, um, describing you know their response to the data that we're presenting here. Um, And so uh, one thing I think that might be interesting for reporters specifically, um, some institutions in, or so, in some counties, there are institutions that have repatriated uh, remains, and there are some institutions that haven't, just within sort of a specific county. And, you know, these decisions are nuanced. It's not necessarily to say that every institution in every, that's in the same, has, that has remains from the same county should have the same repatriation decision. But it is interesting when you see um, counties where, uh, for instance, there's different, um, uh, different determinations from institutions. So let me just find, where is Wasco, Oregon? <laughs> I always have this problem with being able to identify. So in Wasco County, um, you know, 81% of the Native American remains that were taken from this county have been made available for a turn. Um, and that's kind of an interesting, it's not neither 100% or 0%. There are some institutions that have and some institutions that haven't. And we can kind of see in this list here, these are all the institutions who have remains that were taken from Wasco County. Um, the University of California Berkeley is on that list and they have not made the remains that they have from this county available for a turn. Other institutions, including um, Yale, the University of Wyoming, the American Museum of Natural History have. Um, and so in these split counties where you have some institutions that did and some institutions that did not, um, one could argue uh, if you do more research, talk to more folks, um, one could say that there are examples of repatriation happening in this county. And in this county, it seems like um, the repatriations have been primarily to these three tribes. Um, and so, you know, maybe you're interested in this specific county, you're interested in this specific state, you're able to see all the different players who have um, sort of 
operated in this space. Uh, and as a reporter, hopefully it gives you more um, quick leads for who to contact. Um, and then we'll pop over to the tribe page. Uh, I, I could just click one of these. Uh, so this is uh, one of the tribes that operates in the Pacific Northwest region or is based um, in the Pacific Northwest region. Um, and we can see sort of a summary up top. We can see um, these are all the areas where the, um, Native American remains were taken from and then later uh, returned, made available for return to this tribe. Um, and you can see that their territory uh, sort of spans all the way down to California and Nevada. Um, you could see which institutions this tribe has uh, been in consultation with and then had remains made available to return um, from the Department of Defense for uh, this tribe has been in contact with them. Um, and similarly, you can see a timeline. Um, and for tribes, I think uh, there are some tribes where they've had pretty consistent repatriations year over year. For instance, the Hopi, um, the Zuni, a lot of tribes that have um, substantial resources. And there are some tribes where, uh, based on tribal capacity, based on um, a, a number of things, maybe they're, they are working on repatriations, maybe they're not. Um, TIPOs, uh, Tribal Historic Preservation Officers who work on NAGPRA often are quite um, uh, underwater with a lot of requests and a lot of work. And so um, tribal capacity really varies uh, for repatriation. And lastly, um, for tribes, uh, this is a table that kind of uh, puts together the list of institutions that might have remains that uh, are potentially of interest to this tribe. And this was put together using um, the counties that the tribe has already had remains uh, made available. Well, the language is really difficult. <laughs> this is um, basically areas where tribes had remains made available. Nope, still, still getting it wrong. Uh, <laughs> So the institution, um, the institutions on this list have remains that were taken from counties of interest to the tribe. And these are counties where um, they have previously been eligible to claim remains from, um, as well as counties that the tribe uh, sort of has indicated interest in to the federal government through this other data source. Um, so we have the University of California, Berkeley here that has not returned um, 268 remains. And these are coming from counties that might be of interest to the tribe. So this is a starting point um, for tribal historic preservation officers or other tribal representatives um, uh, to start uh, thinking about uh, which institutions might have remains that could be relevant to them. Um, I think that's sort of it, and I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Uh, so I'm going to stop talking at this point. A good number of them, Ash. I think one of them, some of you sort of just touched on a little bit, but um, asking what the difference is between disposition and the repatriation process. Yeah, so um, we mentioned earlier there is sort of this two stages of NAGPRA or two eras of NAGPRA. Um, cultural affiliation is uh, a higher standard. Um, it, I forget exa the exact phrasing, but there is essentially a preponderance of evidence that this group has um, a shared identity with the, uh, the individual represented by the remains. And the preponderance of evidence standard is 50% or above, I believe. Um, disposition doesn't require that level of, of um, evidence. Uh, disposition can happen through geographical affiliation. Um, so this tribe we know has um, historical uh, roots in this area. Um, 
and we know that the remains came from this area. Um, and so it's it's much looser. And therefore, in many cases, the disposition groups are much larger. So you might have five, 10, 20 tribes, depending on the region in the country that are um, dispositioned to the remains. Um, but it's a, a clarifying question. And it says earlier in the opening, uh, you said that less than half of objects have been returned. Um, and so I think it is, what is the source of the data that indicates 50% of objects have, have been or not been repatriated? I, I think I was the one who mentioned um, that fewer than half of ancestral remains have been returned. And if if I if I did say that it was uh, items to or, or alluded to that, I'm sorry, we'd have to check the data real quick to know if what the status is on items since a lot of our reporting is prioritized remains. Um, and I can't yeah. do that just yet, but is that correct, Ash? Yeah, so, objects are different um, and they're hard to count. Uh, so, for instance, one museum might count a necklace as one object, another museum might count every bead in that necklace as several objects. Um, and so I've been sort of told by experts to um, think of the object number as much more loose. Um, the associated funerary object, they're associated to the remains. And so if that um, uh, remains percentage, uh, if the, if, you know, all the remains that are out there sort of get repatriated, so too will all of the associated funerary objects, but it might not be, you know, 50%, 50% um, for both of those things, those categories to be moving together at any one point. Okay. Um, one lot of remains or one um, set of human remains uh, for one individual might come with several dozens, hundreds of objects, um, or just one. And so it's there's not exactly a correlation. Okay. Um, we have a lot of more questions. Um, and certainly if you want to jump in, Ash, if any prioritize to you, but I thought maybe we could get to the sources that we work with also and the documents. And then I would love to answer some of these questions because there's really good ones about um, museums past of collecting outside the United States as well. Um, so lot to cover. Yeah, um, I don't have very much more to say about sources other than um, the Federal Register at federalregister.gov has more detailed information about remains um, and, and objects that were repatriated. Um, and if you're doing something very specific about an institution or tribe, um, they have a search engine um, and you can search for what you need there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, if you are looking for very up-to-date data or more detail, uh, getting in touch with National NAGPRES is the move there. Uh, do we want to move on to, should I take some questions, Mary, or did you want to move on to the next section? Well, and we can, move, maybe I could give you one more and then, um, well, we should move on to sources and docs real quick, sure. but I'd love to answer all these questions before we wrap the whole thing up. Um, a good one, and again, I, I wonder if oh, we'd have to look at the data to answer this, but um, of the portion of remains that are held, what percentage or how many of them don't have location information? Uh, I think it's 13%, um, okay. but there's sort of different numbers. There's a different number between like some don't have counties, but they have states. Some don't have counties or states. Um, and this just gets down to the provenance information that a lot of institutions uh, are missing. Uh, I think here it says institutions reported. Yeah, so we have some of those numbers available right under the map. Um, Shall we jump to sources? Oh, sorry, I'll move the <laughs> I'm driving. Um, so yeah, Ash covered the data sources and now we wanna talk about 
of course, like the people who have been, we found to be very helpful in our reporting. And um, I think represent types of institutions that might exist in all of your areas. Um, and so I'll just say really briefly before handing over to Graham about like method, like ways to cultivate sources. Um, is that I just, I think as we did this reporting, we all started to think about NAGPRA as a landscape um, that is kind of covers a breadth of different types of agencies and institutions and governments. So um, certainly like for starters, there are tribes and within tribes, you may, your point person may be um, a tribal historic preservation officer or someone with the title of cultural director. Um, and then sometimes if it's a, a deep personal priority or, or just a, a leadership priority for the tribal leaders, such as a chairman, governor, president, then um, you may be speaking to the head of the tribe. And when I speak to with, the, with, those, with tribal leaders specifically, I do try to keep in mind, um, I try to call as early as possible, keeping in mind that they um, are also managing many different parts of running their government. Um, making sure people have fun, like there, that there's funding for basic services. Um, and then that we also found um, that in a lot of regions of the country, because of the way I think institutions have interpreted NAGPRA, that there are cultural like or intertribal coalitions, um, which might be a whole, like a group of a dozen tribes or more that have decided to pursue repatriations together so that an institution can't say we can't repatriate to you because we can't repatriate to a single tribe because there's 12 other tribes in the region. If, if they come together with their voice, then they can um, pursue repatriations to their region as a group. Um, and then I think within institutions, it can also be quite a range. Um, I think hopefully an institution has a NAGPRA um, staffer, at least one. If they don't, I think it's worth sort of um, keeping keeping note of that because uh, it says something about that institution and whether they're prioritizing this work um, and funding it. Um, and then also curators, collections managers, um, professors might be on committees that um, that campus repatriation committees, or they may have an expertise in this area as well. Um, and then I'd say maybe most importantly, we've talked a lot about the National NAGPRA office. Um, Melanie O'Brien uh, is, the, is the director of, is the, the, the leader of that office um, and has been a resource herself. She, she and herself have been a good resource. Um, or, and of, most of all, I think also the, the documents that they provide on their website. Um, moving on to the next slide, I think Graham, um, you're, I think you're a good report, a good reporter and that you're, I think, I just admired the way you cultivate sources. And so I wonder if you can go over this for us. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I often tell reporters who are new to Indian country, new to covering indigenous communities that um, that you are kind of a diplomat as well as a reporter. Um, you have to um, be willing to acknowledge um, not just industry-wide failures of covering these communities, but probably your own publication that you work for. Um, and so I think just keeping that in mind um, and just trying to be as patient um, while you're being persistent, um, like Mary mentioned, like reaching out to these tribal reps early and cultivating those relationships is good. Um, because not only are they, like Ash mentioned, are they really overburdened, um, especially if they're a smaller tribe with fewer resources. Um, there's also, you know, a, like a, a, a historic imbalance and inequity at play. Uh, we're dealing with a human rights violation here um, in many cases and or in many regards. And so I think just being very um, thoughtful in the language and how you approach um, these sources, the things that you're looking for. Um, and just um, like, I, like I said, just trying to, to reach out as early as possible. I, I don't think it's um, at all um, unlikely that someone you might approach um, if you've never reported about their tribe um, or their community before 
might perceive this as another, you know, kind of form of parachute journalism, which has been a huge uh, ethical uh, issue when it comes to coverage of indigenous communities. So just keeping all of that in mind, really trying to, um, you know, come to the table um, with a uh, willingness to listen and show up. I know that for a lot of us reporting in these communities, being physically present isn't necessarily an option. Um, but even outside of your reporting on NAGPRA, I would just encourage you as reporters to be working on these relationships um, by just being present in those communities. And this will lead you to other story ideas too, and not to get too much off topic, but these tribal historic preservation officers deal with a lot of things other than NAGPRA. They deal with language specialization, um, with uh, disputes over access to land and, and where the, the borders of, of some of those uh, lands lie. Um, they're, they, they're very, very tapped in people and they are a wealth of knowledge outside of this field too. So um, all that is to say that cultivating these relationships can be very beneficial for you outside of covering NAGPRA um, if you're interested in really truly um, in improving your publication's coverage of these communities. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, yeah, and, and then just understanding that there, this has been mentioned before, but there's a really, really stark differences in how a lot of these tribes, uh, tribal nations and communities approach repatriation for many smaller tribes, even though the something, uh, a funerary object, for instance, um, might have been made available for return, the tribe might not have the capacity to take care of it. And so they develop these relationships with universities where the universities kind of become the, the caretakers of these items. Um, and so um, a lot of these, I guess all that is to say that a lot of these relationships between tribal nations and the institutions they're dealing with aren't, are, are really different from each other. And so, um, yeah, I would just encourage you to, to show up. And, and I'll be honest, a lot, of the, a lot of the leads that we got for these stories were just because we were paying attention to, to committee meetings, um, whether those are state committee meetings or tribal council meetings, and and always being the only reporter in those rooms or the only reporter paying attention to those transcripts and proceedings. And so a lot of you'll find a lot of these things that you're looking for already right out in the public. It's just that no one's paying attention to them. Documents. Um, and as we do that, I was just going to note, in addition to ways we cultivated sources, we had issued a, a call out for leads as a way to listen um, to people and, and also figure out, um, help us figure out the stories to pursue. Um, so that was immensely helpful for us as well. So re records, I think go back one more there, Ash. We're going to go over records. Or having a little bit of trouble there we go yeah cool i can talk about records um okay. so um there were and are a lot of different sorts of records involved with the reporting that we did and then and also the reporting that um we are working on and uh are planning for the future and there are a couple i guess kind of base documents that we've all found very helpful. Um, one sort of document are the earliest inventories that you can get of an institution's holdings. So um, after the law was passed in 1990, the first deadline for institutions to submit to the National Park Service um, it, like a, an inventory of all of their NAGPRA collections was 1995. Uh, a lot of institutions, probably most, didn't make that deadline. So in this, so there are two things to look for here. One, did that institution, one, make their deadline? And uh, if they did not, did they ask for an extension of their inventories from the National NAGPRA office? And then if they did, that sort of, I guess like we can consider that a lead in to look into why what was their reasoning that they gave for why they needed an extension or why they couldn't meet that earliest deadline? And then for the institutions that did meet that deadline, just getting their report that they submitted to uh, the National NAGPRA office. Those are public records. 
Um, you can either ask the institution for those directly. You can FOIA the institution if it's a public institution, or you can also you know, get them from uh, the National NAGPRA office. But looking through those early reports, um, as a reporter, it gives you a lot of context and information about where that institution's head was at. Like, how did they approach even having to do NAGPRA in the first place? And it also gives you a lot of numbers. <laughs> um, it gives you a lot of information about, um, like sometimes they can give you very specific information about which tribes they consulted with or claimed to consult with and which ones they they did not. So, you know, looking for that element is really important. Um, and then any sort of like correspondence that you can find between an institution, either kind of within itself, like within its, you know, you know, few institutions actually have their own sort of full, full-fledged NAGPRA departments. But if you can find correspondence between people at an institution and people in at the National Park Service um, and kind of back and forth of, you know, oh, we 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 found this that we this, you know item in our collections that we didn't know that we had and sort of getting an idea into what these conversations are like can give you as a reporter an understanding of how um, how nuanced and sometimes how complicated it can be. So looking for that. And then also, this is this is a really big one for us. So the law has been around for more than 30 years. There is a NAGPRA review committee that meets a couple of times a year. And this has been happening since I think like 1992 is when they were first talking about um, and trying to write the regulations about like how the law would actually work in practice. All of those, I, I think that they're all still available online. Um, those transcripts are all available on the National NAGPRA office website. So you can go back in the archives like meeting by meeting and there are, there, are, there are so many, but you can download the folder of that meeting, get the transcripts. And then also I think in, in, in most meetings, you can also get any attached meetings materials um, that were included with that. So what we did is, you know, compiled all of these transcripts, transcripts into a searchable, searchable database so that we can quickly look up um, either an institution or even a theme um, and kind of get a sense over time of what the conversation, at least in the NAGPRA review committee, um, what that conversation was like and how that evolved. And I should say the NAGPRA review committee, they're generally, you know, meetings that the public can come to and their meeting of, I forget how many uh, people are actually on it, but I think it's, I wanna say seven, um, you know, kind of representatives of various like interests in the NAGPRA process. So some might be from like on behalf of the Society for American Archeology, span some of them will be tribal leaders, some of them are government officials or federal agency representatives. So this is supposed to be a committee that can hear any disputes that, a tribe might might bring to them about um, you know what's going on with how they are you know trying with, with their relationships with an institution. So we can hear disputes. It can you know implement new regulations, and just like you know talk about like particular cases and particular instances um, that are kind of, of of tricky to navigate. So that was a really useful resource for us, and those are publicly available online. And another pretty important bucket that is fairly easy to, to get information about is the NAGPRA grants program. So it's actually part of the law that um, the interior, I don't know if they specify which agency, but there is a bucket of money that Congress makes available um, that can be distributed to both institutions and tribes for consultation and repatriation. And the government um, can grant you these, you know, these different like buckets of money for different uh, repatriation or consultation projects. And if you are, you know, reporting on 
a particular institution and their their return rate or their relationship with the tribe, you should definitely get a sense through this information if they have applied for national NAGPRA grants before. If so, what were they trying to work on? Did they get that money or not? Because the the national NAGPRA program actually like, it keeps track of um, declined grants as as well. So it's just good to know what they were, what an institution was trying to do or what a tribe was trying to do because there is every year there's been, um, I believe more tribes and institutions like looking for money than they act, than the national NAGPRA program actually has available. So this is also a big hang up in, in, in the law itself. Um, but as a reporter, it's important to familiarize yourself with what has happened with that institution and, and tribe in the past. There's a lot more, but that's, that's, I'll keep it to that for now. And I'm happy to answer questions. I'll answer questions about this later too. Move to our last slide um, and show it. I think it's a great place to end. Um, and just keep in mind, I think, as some of the, um, some of the things that I think we, try to adhere to through our reporting. Um, maybe especially fitting since we had kind of started with cultural sensitivity. Um, and while that's posted there, I think we're gonna go ahead and um, jump to questions since we're limited on time and there are so many of them, if that's okay with, with the team. Um, so let's see, let's get to, there's a lot of good ones. Um, I thought this was really a thoughtful question. Uh, what are the characteristics of successful repatriation efforts, both on the tribal side and the institutional side? Um, you know, are you museums more likely than other types of entities to return remains? And I think maybe we could just summarize some of what we've heard from sources of what's, what's worked well and not. Um, I can go first briefly and just say on the tribal side, it seems that I, when I think a tribe feels that their claim to their ancestors is not dismissed, um, and if, especially if they're citing tribal knowledge and their histories and cultural information, um, that is considered successful and also successful when an institution does not press them for um, maybe especially delicate, private, and sensitive cultural information. Um, and then also, I think when the tribe feels that they've had a chance to be at the table with the institution and be heard. The others have? Anything? Yeah, um, just to add to that, um, one thing that I've, that I've heard that has been successful um, with institutions is when when a curator or a NAGPRA coordinator, whoever's doing NAGPRA, you know, whatever museum, they don't withhold any information from tribes. Um, this, I mean, and museums have tons, or sometimes, sometimes they have nothing, but, but sometimes there's tons of information available about particular collections and um, even, you know, notes from the person who excavated, you know, this, you know, these human remains and other objects. Um, it's, I, I've heard of institutions just basically making a gigantic Dropbox or Google Drive or whatever file sharing uh, the capability you have and just trying to upload everything you can so you know that you are having these conversations or consultations um, with that, that are a bit more transparent and that everybody has access to the same sort of information. Yeah, I think tribal consultation is like the such a huge key to a successful repatriation, like relying on traditional tribal like knowledge, whether like that's geographical, historical, cultural, whatever that might be, and giving it equal footing. I, I would point to, um, I think it'll still be years before I could answer the question of whether or not it was successful or how successful it was, of course, because it takes a long time. But what the University of North Dakota did recently with their discovery um, they found, I, I want to say it was like 70 uh, remains and some pretty um, terrible conditions and boxes and, and storage. No one really knew they were there because no one had really looked since pre-NAGPRA. Uh, 
Um, it was a really, really uh, like horrifying and tough situation, especially for the tribes in and around the University of North Dakota. Um, but if you go and look at the University of North Dakota, it's like they, they created a whole website to answer questions. They, they, they really made efforts to be as transparent with tribes as possible. And I think like they showed that if they can do it, that it can be done uh, in a really thoughtful way. Um, and so, yeah, I think reaching out to tribes very, very early for consultation and advice and guidance is, is a really, is a really important one. Yeah, I'll also make note of being proactive. I think there's the question of what the law, uh, the letter of the law expects and what the spirit of the law is. Um, there are some institutions that have said, you know, we reached out to the tribes in 1999, we didn't hear back from them since then, and, you know, our legal obligations are fulfilled. And that doesn't, you know, maybe true, uh, but that doesn't get to the spirit of the law. And I think um, a lot of the uh, tribes are getting mail from all across the country, from the correspondence from institutions across the country, and keeping track of that all can be difficult. So just being proactive, I think, is something that has been proactive and consistent is something that has been brought up on the institutional side. Um, and then in terms of which types of entities are more likely to return remains, um, just sort of anecdotal and subjective, but you can sort of see uh, geographical patterns. Um, so in areas where there are uh, tribes that haven't had um, uh, have had been dis displaced less than perhaps other populations. I think there's been more continuity of uh, traditions, of communities, of, of history, and uh, many of those tribes have had um, some greater success in having their ancestors returned, um, and also are just able to more readily cultivate relationships with institutions in their area because they have a physical presence, and they don't necessarily need to get on a plane every time they need to talk to an institution. Um, uh, those are some of the trends that we've seen. Uh, the federal government also is itself uh, subject to the law. And in many ways, um, some of the National Park Service units have pretty close connections to tribes that operate in their area. Um, and some of those uh, sort of agencies have seen some success. Um, Comparatively, some institutions have a history of, of scientific research and interest and in holding on to remains for uh, those reasons. And um, you'll, you'll find sometimes lower numbers and repatriation, lower repatriation numbers at those institutions. I'll turn this next question to Logan um, or start it off with you. And what do you see as the biggest denial of why institutions such as public universities may deny records requests? Um, and how would you suggest what for reporters? Sure. Um, you know, <laughs> we've run into institutions, even though something is technically a public record, they, some institutions are hesitant to re to give you those records because they might be in consultation with various tribes and um, they feel uncomfortable <laughs> giving you that information. And, and you know, rightly so. Um, for, I guess, just from personal experience, institutions have been less hesitant if it's something from, if, if you're asking for records from a while back and their institution has showed some signs of change. So if I, it's kind of dependent sometimes on how much staff turnover they've had um, and, you know, and how you, how we've gotten around that. So, I don't know if we've like, if we've really gotten around a lot of these issues, but I would say if you can um, try to have a good relationship with whichever tribes are in consultation with that institution. And that's a whole other sort of aspect of this reporting is, is your relationship with various, with various tribes. Um, because sometimes, you know, an institution will tell you that they don't want you to have certain information because it, because the tribes want to keep it private, but then various, you know, tribal leaders or, or historic preservation officers will, will just, you know, either send them to you or say, I don't know why they, 
why they want to to keep this from you. Um, you know, in some ways, part of the reason why there's this backlog is because of a lot of, you know, kind of secrecy around this. So, but that's not, that's not to say that, um, you know, tribes aren't going to, you know, tell you that, that this is private. And I think as a reporter, in more than, probably in more so than any other, you know, stories that I've worked on, when somebody uh, says that they don't want to talk because they're in active consultations, I haven't pushed it, <laughs> you know, like that's, that's pretty serious. That, that can be very sensitive and you actually have a lot of, um, I think like, you know, like in it, potentially a lot of influence or power as a reporter, if you are, if you are this like external factor, like poking your nose into this very um, sensitive dynamic. And a lot of the times you're trying to like rebuild relationships. So I guess just making sure that um, uh, a tribal leader, whoever's, whoever is involved with the consultations knows that you are there and that you are interested. And, you know, sometimes I have shared public records with various tribal leaders to show that, you know, this is information, this might be, you know, a, of interest to you. Um, I'm saying I'm, I'm around <laughs> um, and check in every couple months like you would do, but, and, but letting people know that you are not actually going to repeatedly be getting in touch with them as you might for some, for, you know, a different topic. Yeah, I would just a add, little off topic there, but I think I answered two people's questions with that one. So I think so. Yeah. And I would just um, agree with those points. Repatriation is, well, I think museums withholding ancestral domains is very, can be very painful. And sometimes I think a tribe wants to go through that privately, um, in which case we keep the door open, but um, respect their wishes. Um, do we have time for one more? Mary, can I just make a point on that? Um, one one thing that um, we've heard from some tribal historic preservation officers is maybe they don't want to have stories out about specific repatriations or consultations with institutions that are ongoing. Um, but a lot of, I think, tribal historic preservation officers are interested to talk about funding and being able to get more awareness around um, uh, the their sort of inability to do the work that needs to be done because of the high levels of turnover and the lack of resources. Um, so it might be about pivoting the story to not be focused on the numbers or a specific institution to tribal relationship um, and something that comes from just talking with your sources about what is top of mind for them. I'll go to the next question. Um, thanks for that, Ash. Uh, Graham, I'll direct this one to you. Um, what are some of the potential pitfalls you see or could see journalists um, encountering with the story? Um, I think there's a lot, but I think um, some of them can just be your your word choices, your your language in the story. Um, you know, I, I think it's important to remember that like you're not just writing about like a failure to follow a federal law. You're talking. You're this is you know, this is generations of, um, you know, um, tr treating these communities with with disrespect uh, to like a, a pretty high degree. Um, and so I, I think it's important to just like make sure that you're representing that in, that the inequitable circumstances at play in your stories. These are some really powerful institutions that some of these tribal nations have to take on with, like Ash just mentioned, like very limited staff, right? Um, and so, and, and then I also think it's just like applying like the same ethical standard to these communities that you do your own. Um, Mary and I talked a lot about the word sacred. She knows how I feel about it. Um, like, I think it can be a really useful word, but I also think it gets thrown around in a kind of a lazy way by reporters um, when you could be, explaining things like in more with more specificity or just the idea that you know these remains uh, are important to native nations because you know our ancestral remains are sacred to us and it's kind of like well everyone's debt is sacred to them like this is a universal 
uh, I think a, a problem that is universally understandable no matter where you're from. Um, and then, um, yeah, I, I think just um, just being um, uh, cognizant of those of those that the, his, the historical inequity um, because the, the inequity also isn't just something that's in the past; it's present day. Like these, the information that is gathered. Of, I'm thinking particularly of funerary objects, uh, cultural information, things like that. I guarantee you, most of the tribes that you talk to are are going to tell you that the the things that were collected, the research that was done that wasn't shared with the people it was taken from. And so it begs the question of like, you know, this indigenous data sovereignty question of like, where does this data go? Um, who has access to it? And what is it being used for? Um, uh, one of the points that we made in our, our story about the University of Alabama in particular was that when when they told the, the tribal nations, the Muscogee and speaking tribes um, that, were, that were trying to force the repatriation is that, well, we need to re-inventory them, do CT scans, do gather new research and Tribes were not okay with that. That's the, you know, how having access to their ancestral remains um, and what you what these institutions do with that access is also an important question to be asking. Items that exist in the United States, but are that are, excuse me, are currently in the United States or in US institutions, but have um, come from Canada and or also asking about what European institutions hold. Um, so do you mind discussing the extent to which the data or the limits of the data on that front? Um, yeah, well, sadly, the limits of the data are the US national boundaries. Um, NAGPRA only extends uh, to that realm and is only, is only US, uh, federally funded US institutions that are subject to it. Um, one thing that we tried to do on the maps was sort of, instead of just having the U.S. map hovering with no sort of other land masses around it, is just demonstrating that, you know, Mexico and Canada are connected land masses and they're indigenous tribes that um, cross the boundaries of, that we presently have in, in modern society. Um, I don't have very much more to say on that topic. Uh, it's sort of a frustrating part of sovereign nation existences, uh, but that's how it is now. Thank you. Um, we have a question I think I can answer um, directly or briefly, but it is that I run into trouble finding Native American organizations to speak to in Louisiana. Uh, any advice on how to find these sources? Um, I have not reported in Louisiana. However, I think just generally speaking about finding sources in your region, um, we've shared the list of TIPO organizations, I believe, in the comments. And of course, gave the caveat that I think they have limited resources and maybe availability to talk, but um, they are a, can be a resource. And then I think, um, obviously reaching out to the tribal nations. And then in addition, um, I think you can maybe look for nonprofits and that would be another ProPublica tool. Um, we'll use using the Nonprofit Explorer to find, um, potentially try to find um, nonprofits that serve native people. Um, so let me, and I can now jump to the next question, I, I think we have time for one more at least, and this one can be for all of us. Um, what is the biggest takeaway, or this is a very broad, but uh, probably is also very important. Um, what is the biggest takeaway or most important thing reporters should know or understand as they go about reporting on this story? I would direct to, I think the last slide we had on um, sort of identify, like which, I think is our list of um, sort of values that we always wanted to keep in mind while doing the story, understanding that um, first and foremost, you're writing about a human rights issue or, or NAGPRA's written, uh, recognizes human rights law, but I'd love to hear from my colleagues. I think for me, um, I, a lot of this reporting is just challenged so many assumptions that I didn't even realize that I was making. Um, you know, it's not 
it's it's important to keep in mind as you're reporting all of this that it's not that every tribe doesn't have the same sort of preferred outcome of how they want the repatriation process to go and what should happen it completely so don't um just assume that there's that there's one sort of pathway and that that pathway ends with um always ends with reburial i mean often it does but sometimes that doesn't make sense at that time so i guess just being open to that and then also i guess like being pretty mindful of um how a lot of uh i guess like interests or sorts of fields of this really intersect like there are um you know like tribal archaeologists there's cultural there like science and tribal interests are not mutually exclusive and i think that that is sort of like the cleaner wrong narrative um but they intersect and bounce off of each other in ways that are really worth paying attention to I could jump in. Um, what I was going to say was fairly similar to what Logan is saying. Um, you know, as someone who's not native coming into this project, we really did try to go slowly um, and do our due diligence and talk to people who have been doing this for decades, um, some on a volunteer basis, some as their careers. Uh, and it's not just, you know, now Pro has passed 30 years ago, but it's really covering a like 10,000 years in some cases of human history on this land. Um, and I, sometimes I feel sort of complicated about being a data reporter because numbers don't tell the full story. And I, so I think the hope that I would have for local reporters who are interested in doing something on this is to maybe not necessarily turn around a quick story that's pretty numbers heavy. Um, I think it's a good place to start uh, and can give you a sense of patterns and relationships, but um, developing sources, uh, getting in touch with people who are doing this work on a regular basis and learning about the stories behind the numbers, because that's, I wish we could have provided more of that, um, but we've read so many instances of uh, all kinds of ways that remains of Native Americans have ended up in museums. Um, and I think uh, those stories are what give repatriation um, a lot more life past just the numbers basis. Uh, the only thing I, I agree with everything that's been said, the only thing that I would add is that, um, that the law exists today because of generations of indigenous activism and like asserting um, our humanity and our, you know, um, the fact that we deserve basic dignity and respect. Um, people like Maria Pearson in the 70s and um, Walter Echohawk, who's still alive today, and the work that he did. And um, the, the law didn't happen because the United States suddenly decided that it had been doing something horribly wrong since its inception. Um, it, it, the law was put in place because Indigenous people forced it to be put in place. Well, that's a great place uh, for us to wrap things up. Um, I want to start by thanking all of our speakers, uh, Mary, Logan, Ash, and Graham. You guys all did a tremendous job. Thank you for lending uh, your reporting expertise and insight on this pressing issue. Um, thank you to all of you in the audience. Um, once again, you know we're excited to see what you do with this data. We'd love to uh, uh, know about it. So if you could please send us your news stories or whatever outcome might uh, come of this by emailing events at propublica.org and putting repatriation in the subject line. We'd love to see it. Um, from all of us at ProPublica, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time. <laughs>